few words further about what Newton was saying about why mutation analysis may not be done. So about 10, 20 years ago, uh, really the holy grail of cancer research is personalised medicine. In other words, rather than saying that we've got 30,000 people a year with lung cancer, we lump them together into very broad subgroups of non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer, but we know that people's tumours behave differently. So taking the colorectal cancer analogy, we have some patients who can have a tiny little tumour, but widespread disease elsewhere. But other patients who've clearly had bowel cancer for a long time, who come into hospital with the most huge lumps from their colon, and no metastases. So clearly the biology of those two tumours, in other words their underlying behaviour, is very different. So the theory is great. We take a biopsy, we do lots of tests in the laboratory and we say, okay, we can match drug X to that particular tumour, we can match drug Y to your tumour, and this is personalised medicine, and it'll be cocktails probably of drugs, a little bit like HIV. The problem is that what's happened in the States in particular is that certain institutions have taken on very large programs where what they've done is they've biopsied the primaries, they've biopsied the secondaries, and they've biopsied them as you go through the course of the disease. In other words, at the start, when they metastasize, after six months after treatment. And the problem is that actually the tumors change and change very rapidly and actually not in a reproducible fashion. So that is sort of leading people to worry a little bit more about personalised medicine, because it's a bit like trying to shoot your football into the goal, and actually the tumour, which is very, very um, actually sophisticated beast, has actually moved the goalposts out of the way. So where medicine is going with these targeted treatments is actually about identifying subgroups of patients. And so I think that what we'll see is rather than personalised medicine, certainly in the next 10 years, I think that's a term that sounds great, but is probably unrealistic, but we'll see cohorts of patients. So wild type just is clearly a cohort of patients compared to, for example, those who express CK11, CD117. And so this idea of personalised medicine that sounds great, actually the tumours are probably more clever and evolve better than that. external pictures, they, were, they should all be downloaded. <laughs> so, um, I've been asked to talk to you about drugs and treatments that are actually happening at the moment and also in the pipeline for GIST. And GIST, of course, is a fascinating tumour for us and it is one of the modern successes of cancer medicine. And in fact, it's a relatively recent um, diagnosis. The term only came into being in 1984, so we're only 20 years into GISTs. And I think if you said to most doctors 20 years ago, that patient's got a GIST, they'd probably have looked at you and, with a fairly blank, blank expression. What we've understood over the last few years is that previously what used to happen is people would see these GISTs, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, and probably thought, oh, it's just a benign little bit of muscle growth, and probably ignored the vast majority of them. And conventionally, it was said less than 10% are malignant. And I think what we're realising is actually far more of them are malignant than we thought. The other problem was, as oncologists, when I started off, is essentially our treatments didn't work. Chemotherapy doesn't work. Radiotherapy doesn't really work. And so we didn't actually see GISTs. And in fact, I can remember sending one of the first patients in the UK for imatinib uh, in Taunton, to, to a friend uh, called Ian Judson, who's a really major leader in this country, who said, you know, I've got a drug for this tumour called GIST. I said, have you? So he said, it works really well, so off the patients went. But actually, this is a great example of basic oncology research coming into clinical practice. And this is what often um, a GIST looks like. So this is the lining of the stomach here. And it's not an ulcer in the stomach, so a stomach cancer, you'd see breakdown of all this tissue, but it's something underneath, if you like, the lining of the stomach wall. And this is an ultrasound, so this is where they put an ultrasound probe on the end of the gastroscopy, and you can see there's the probe there, there's the lining of the stomach there, and there's that tumour underneath the lining there. And that's a typical site for a gist, of course, within the, within the lining of the stomach wall, and that's the typical appearance. And what will happen is the endoscopist will take a biopsy, 
And because you've got a very narrow tube to put your biopsy forceps down, essentially they take a little bite and usually, of course, nick the top here rather than getting actually into the tumour itself. So initially, there may be quite a bit of diagnostic difficulty in actually identifying this. Therefore, because it's outside the lining, the most important investigation is a CT scan. And whilst I'm going to talk about drugs, we should remember that the curative treatment for a GIST is actually removing it surgically. And unlike most other tumours where you have to take all the supporting tissues away and all the lymph glands away, so in other words, a very major resection, actually, for a GIST, you just need to take the tumour away. So in fact, the surgeons quite like that because rather than having to do a major operation, they can often do a nice little laparoscopic excision that is organ preserving. In other words, it doesn't remove the whole of the stomach, just where that tumour is. And they can use all their fancy kit as well. So, it's a, so that's usually when we say, OK, they can have localised excision, you can almost see the hands rubbing with delight. But that's good. You want a surgeon who's keen and competent. Even before Glyvec came along, there was a more aggressive approach being taken when this disease had spread to the liver. And so these are in the, this is data from the years before Glyvec. And in a disease when it spread and there was no treatment available, the average survival for patients with GIST was around 5 to 12 months. So you can see that when localised, when the surgeon could remove all the disease, there was still more than half of the patients were alive after three years, so much better than untreated. But there are still quite a number of patients where it's worthwhile actually doing things to the liver. In other words, not just and one such technique is hepatic artery embolization, and I'll show you what that is in a, in a minute, which actually seems to stabilize patients. And whether you're actually doing it because you're killing the blood flow off to that area or the chemotherapy you put in, I suspect the former rather than the latter, it seems to stabilize the disease and reduces one of the complications of untreated GIST, which of course is bleeding, one of the ways that they present in the middle of the night. So this shows how you can actually survive patients following liver resection. And this is what hepatic artery embolization is. So what we have here is this is an MRI scan. And there's a tumor deposit there. And there's a tumor deposit there. And this is the liver. That's the spleen. And that's the stomach. And that's the backbone. So embolization means embolize. That's putting something into a blood vessel. So this is what's called an angiogram. So what happens is that a catheter is put in through the femoral artery under visual guidance, and then contrast media is put into those blood vessels. And this blush here, this is effectively where the tumour is, and there. And so what you want to do is those blood vessels are feeding the tumour, because that's one of the other things advanced in cancer medicine, knowing that actually that the tumour is not just a tumour cell, but it has to develop a structure to survive. So it has to have supporting cells, it has to have blood vessels as well feeding through it. And here are all those blood vessels. So the philosophy is that you then put something in here and something in here that cuts off the blood supply to that tumour. And that's the process of embolization. And here's a happy radiologist, because there's a blood vessel with something in it, no tumour blush. There's the blood vessel there, no tumour blush. And so that's been very effective. And that's the sort of approach appearance you see on now on a CT scan after embolization. And it's only been partially successful because it was such a big tumour. But this, here's your liver, there's your spleen, there's your backbone. And this is really dead tumour or cystic degeneration. And remember that when the radiologists look at GISTs, we're interested in cystic degeneration. So normally when we assess a tumour for a response to treatment, we want to see it shrink. At first with GIST, you may not see that because you get this cystic degeneration. So that's quite a common, that was a common catch when treatments first came. And this rim here, there's probably just a little bit of active tumour still left there. So although we think about drugs a lot, and that's the way that treatment of GIST has gone, and of course what people are interested in, it's very important to remember that old-fashioned treatments, surgery, hepatic artery embolization, still have a very important role in this disease. And it's one of the reasons why multidisciplinary teams, which I know Karis Morgan is coming to talk to you about this afternoon, is important. Because clearly, you want to have the input of the whole team. So that's the radiologists who are going to look at your scans and tell you whether you're winning or losing. 
The radiologists will do your hepatic artery embolization, your surgeons who may attempt to remove these things, and your oncologists who give the treatment. And your pathologists like Newton who say, well, hold on, chaps, that's a wild type, just that's why treatment isn't working. So and that team, that team approach to cancer, is probably the biggest development in cancer in the UK in the last 10 to 15 years. A requirement that every patient with cancer is discussed at a multidisciplinary team. And hopefully that will start to feed through into the overall survival statistics. So, the target of Gleevec seek it. And it was originally described appearing on very um, immature blood cells, that's hemopoietic cells, and it's a target that can induce growth. So we now know that it's actually expressed on a wide spectrum of cells, both during embryonic development and also our adult life. For example, blood cells, stem cells and progenitor cells, and melanocytes and germ cells. These are cells that are actually developing all the cells within our body. And because we like to think in relatively simple ways, here's the sort of target, and this is what the receptor looks like. And so it's got parts outside the cell, and it's got parts inside the cell. And that's important for thinking about how you're actually going to target that receptor. You're going to target the whole receptor, bits inside, and there's the tyrosine kinase catalin domain, so that's where matinib binds here inside the cell. But you've got the option outside the cell as well. So there are a number of ways that you can actually um, affect that particular target. But as we've already said, it gets more complicated. And this is the um, abbreviated diagram. <laughs> so when you start going to meetings, you'll have someone who is an international expert, for example, on CDK4. And the CDK4 expert will then have a pathway here of another 120 things which just flashes up. And he'll then talk about number 118, about 120. So our knowledge about the biology of cancer is actually exploding. But the problem that we have is that cells are very clever. So in other words, you can have this target, which you think is terribly important, but the cell is actually a bit more clever than that. And as you can see with these pathways, and as we already talked a bit about earlier, there are ways around these targets. So it's a bit having your light switched, and you're there turning it on and off, but actually, there's a circuit in someone's upstairs that can switch the light on and off just as well. It's just like that. And cells, these pathways, are probably not set in stone at the start of a cell's life. They probably evolve and change as time goes on. And that's probably one of the reasons how cells become resistant to treatment, and also why you need to select, probably as we go further on, subgroups of patients where actually the switch that you're trying to turn on and off is actually the relevant switch for that patient. And probably the best example of that at the moment is in colorectal cancer, where we have a target that we know that if, you're, if you express that particular target, your what's called EGFR wild type, that the treatment can work. Whereas if you're mutant, in other words, the switch isn't working, the treatment isn't going to work at all. So in other words, having targets which you know actually define that a treatment isn't going to work are probably just as important as defining uh, those targets where treatment is definitely going to work. So I think that the message is that it gets more complicated as, as time goes on, and it's important to understand that that's why now the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are working well when Glyvec doesn't work, are essentially because they're targeting more than one pathway. So in other words, if you can start to target a number of these different pathways, that are overexpressed in a given cell, you've got a higher chance of your treatment being effective. And so there's the drug that changed the, the game, and there are now, I think, many hundreds of patients around the country, and probably internationally, whose lives have been considerably changed by this gold and wonderful drug. And for us, it's great for people with GIST, and great for people with some forms of leukemia, but wish we had a drug like this for lung cancer. Wish we had a drug like this for bowel cancer. It's a complete changer. How does it work? It works inside the cell, and it's an antagonist of the ATP binding site, and therefore it interrupts the signal transaction. In other words, it is like a switch. And it's important to think that actually this is a relatively recent thing. This treatment only started in March 2000. The first patient was only treated 12 years ago. And it was a 50-year-old lady who had come in with a large gastric tumour and metastases, and they were removed. She failed what was 
treatment at the time, chemotherapy, interferon, and thalidomide. That's the, uh, so thalidomide is a drug that reduces blood vessel formation in tumours, actually. It's quite a, can be quite effective in some sarcomas. Of course, it then got a terrible press for fairly obvious reason. But she, very soon after starting the treatment, had a very rapid decline um, in her tumour volume. And that's one of the messages about imatinib, isn't it? That when you start treatment, if it's going to work, it works very quickly and very effectively. People, just within a few days of treatment, feeling much better and their tumours have shrunk. Anyway, this lady's response continued for 14 months and was more than 80%. And it led to formal testing in phase one and two. Because in fact, it was actually entirely by chance that this lady with GIST was actually treated with um, uh, this drug, Glyvec. Because what happens is when a drug is tested, by and large, most new drugs come into practice by being tested in people who have failed all previous treatment. So it's actually just sheerly fortuitous that it happened to be a lady with GIST who actually went into that phase one trial. So if she hadn't, this may never have been discovered. And this is how we assess response. So this is a PET scan at the top here. And this is what the scans show. So as you can see, here's this huge tumour. I mean, this lady, this is her pelvis. You just wonder where all her other organs were, don't you? <laughs> then very soon after, a few days after, it's shrinking. And there's very little left there. You can now, now see the gut and the rectum there and the bladder in front. And that's mirrored on the PET scan, which is a, a, where you're given a radioactive isotope that is preferentially taken up by dividing tissues. So if the tissue is metabolic active, it comes up as black. And if it, you don't see it, then it's not metabolically active. And these tumours can lose their metabolic activity within 48 hours of starting Gleevec. And PET scans are a very good way of assessing early response to the TKIs, particularly in just, in fact, probably in some forms of lymphoma as, as, as well. And in the very first US study, Remember I said that the average survival of the people with advanced GIST was 5 to 12 months with no treatment? Here you can see 9 out of 10 patients are alive after, after 52, 60 weeks. So after a year of treatment, still the vast majority of patients are alive. So a clearly a goal-changing goal drug. So clearly we know that it works in the advanced setting and we've got a number of patients who've been on treatment. I've got a patient who's been on Glyvec for 10 years and their disease hasn't, hasn't progressed. So we started thinking about using it in other settings. And one of the um, settings that we see now is we see a patient who comes in with a huge tumour. For example, that scan of the pelvis being a very good example. The surgeon might try and operate on that, but it's very unlikely he's going to remove it all. And secondly, there's a group of patients who really the surgeons look at and say, well, you know, I'm very sorry, they're very too elderly to have an operation, or they've got too many other medical problems to have an operation. So we have people whose hearts won't stand an anaesthetic, whose lungs won't stand an anaesthetic, or they don't want to have an operation. So we started asking the question, can we actually use it to shrink tumours, or can we actually use it as a primary treatment? In other words, you don't need to have an operation to have it removed. And this was what's called a phase two study, which is testing that sort of theory to see whether it worked. And the problem with it is that yes, it shrinks it, but actually it doesn't seem to shrink it for very long. About half of patients, the disease is progressing after about two years of treatment. And that may be because in fact, probably haven't given the amount to nip for long enough. So our own practice is that if we're trying to downstage a tumor, we'll do it for no more than three to six months and then ask the surgeon again. So it's a useful approach but if you take it as a very long-term approach, many patients will have progression. The other thing is that if we know that tumours have a high chance of coming back, can we stop them coming back? So people with breast cancer will very commonly have their breast lump removed and then be given treatment afterwards to try to stop it coming back. So we know that if the tumour comes back, by and large it's incurable. So we're asking, can we use our not terribly good treatments diseases like breast cancer, to actually um, improve the chance of cure. And what we understand with GISTs is that the risk of progression is dependent on a number of things. In other words, they're coming back. It's dependent on where it started. So, for example, gastric tumours tend to do better than, than small bowel or rectal tumours. 
it matters how big the tumour is, so a tumour that is more than 10 centimetres is always going to be bad by definition, and it also depends how fast it's dividing. So in other words, how many cells you see actively dividing under the microscope. And you look on a number of what's called high-powered fields. So that's where Newton will look at a high-powered field and he'll count the number of mitoses. In other words, that cell's actively dividing and issue a report according to that. And we can then segregate our resected tumours into these groups of low, moderate and high. And that now drives what we do. Do we just follow them up? Do we know what the chance of cure is? Or do we actually give some imatinib to try to stop it coming back? And this is the algorithm that we have. And what is, I think, particularly pleasing for someone who's a technophobe like me is there's now an Apple app which you can actually do with this. So it's always a great pleasure. We sit our MDTs and Newton shouts out the figures and I put them into my mobile phone. And at that there, we've got the computerised way of actually telling you what the risk of relapse is and we decide at that meeting where we're going to give adjuvant treatment or not. And the adjuvant treatment is almost always given to the high-risk patients who are likely to relapse within two to three years of the surgery. And that's where the Cancer Drugs Fund have helped because mice won't let us use um, imatinib in the uh, adjuvant setting. They will let us use it in the advanced disease setting, but we got the drug from the Cancer Drugs Fund. Does everybody know what the Cancer Drugs Fund was about? Yeah. It matters for people like with people with GIS, because it's a way of getting access to these drugs, which really wasn't very well dealt with before. So the first trial that was done asked whether it gave asked whether giving 12 months of treatment was better than no treatment. And essentially, this slide here is what's called recurrence-free or progression-free survival. So the top line is if you have the treatment, but the bottom line is if you don't have the treatment. So what you can see is that patients are progressing who don't have the treatment, but that's not translated into the chances of beating the cancer, in other words, of being alive. Why is that? Because when you relapsed, you got given the Glyvec then. It's very effective, so effectively, what you're doing is you're salvaging patients at that time. So that's probably why you don't see a survival advantage. And sometimes in medicine, we call this the melon effect. In other words, you see a very early advantage, and then you lose it with the passage of time. That's probably not the case. There is a genuine advantage in survival, which was really found when you started testing 12 months versus three years of uh, treatment. And this was a trial of 400 patients, high risk group, large tumours, lots of mitoses, or the tumour had ruptured and compared 12, with three, 12 months with three years of treatment. And what you can see here, and that's the survival curve, there's a genuine improvement in survival at five years for patients who've had three years of GISTs. So rather than the majority of patients relapsing, now, 92% of patients are actually alive at five years who've had Glyvex. So it's a major step forward, and it's become standard of, standard of care for us. So the next question was that some patients actually don't tolerate imatinib very well. I don't, know how, I don't know how many people in this room have had it, but certainly elderly females in particular seem to struggle with the periorbital edema, and the fatigue that comes with it, and sometimes the diarrhoea with it. So what we'd like to do is we don't like to make our patients ill, we want to make them better. So then the question came, if you shrank the tumour a lot, why not give people a treatment break? They're going to be off treatment, they're going to feel rather better, and then go back on it when, um, when people aren't so well. But the message about Glyvec is that even if you stop it for a very short period of time, the tumour often comes back very quickly. And this continuous dosing, continuous suppression of the disease does seem to be very important. And this was actually tested in this trial here, where this is the group who continued treatment, and this is survival probability, chance of being alive. But those who stopped their Glyvec when the tumour got better, they seemed to die actually really quite quickly. Now, many of these were salvaged again by restarting Im imatinib in practice. But the message does seem to be that this drug needs to be taken continuously to continuously um, suppress the disease. So, we've talked about what we do when we've removed the tumour. We've talked quite a lot about Glyvec, how we actually use it. We use it continuously. So what happens when it stops working? 
when one of these other mutations perhaps comes to the tumour or perhaps is starting to show its ugly head? Well, the first thing is that there's a difference between a generalised progression, say if you have disease all over the body, does it get bad everywhere, or does it actually just get worse in one or two areas? And there's now quite good data that if it gets worse in just one area, for example, you've got disease in your abdomen, for example, say five or ten lumps, but then one lump gets bigger in the liver, that actually just dealing with that one lump with local treatments, in other words, surgery, is a good idea. And this is a trial that actually shows that. So here's a patient with limited disease progression. You can see that they're surviving for much longer by having something done to that local progression than those where it's less and it's generalised progression. And so that may mean, exactly as Newton was saying, that the disease may not be the same in every single area of the body. Certain may, may, it may, some of it may still actually be well suppressed, and it may just be that one lump that's getting worse that has the mutation, and that's why it should be removed surgically. So before you change the drugs, if you've just got one or two lesions, we go back and ask our surgeons, is there something further that can be done with local regional therapy? The other thing that can be done is increasing the dose from 400 milligrams per day to 800 milligrams per day if it's tolerated, and Newton's genetic analysis can help to actually tell us which patients that's most likely to benefit. The drug, however, that we use as second-line treatment and is approved by NICE is sunitinib. And this is a rather odd dosing of sunitinib. So sunitinib is a drug where it was first used in kidney cancer, and the standard dosing is to have four weeks on and two weeks off. And I think many of us are starting to think, well, actually, if you need to take Glyvec continuously, why don't you need to take sunitinib continuously? And certainly, um, I've now got two patients who um, progress very rapidly when their sunitinib had a break, and they now have it on the low dose con continuous. Not supposed to, but we just do it. Mm -hmm. And so this is a chart that shows some of the secondary mutations that, um, that Newton's talked to you about, about how the, the tumour changes its tail. But really, Sutton was quite a major step forward as well. So this was a trial which compared Sutton, second-line treatment, in other words, after a matinee who had failed, and it compared it with having a placebo. And the time to the cancer getting worse was nearly six months, 27 weeks in the Sutton arm, six weeks as you'd expect in the placebo arm. Now again, in this study, there was actually no difference in survival because the placebo arm crossed over to the sutent arm. But there are various statistical ways of actually seeing whether this sort of data does, would actually translate into an overall survival benefit if patients hadn't crossed over from the placebo arm onto the treatment arm, and there does seem to be a genuine um, improvement in survival with the use of sutent. And the other thing that's really quite good about these TKIs in GIST is that actually, by our standards, as people who give out a lot of chemotherapy, they're actually, for most patients, pretty well tolerated. There's a bit of anemia, a bit of neutropenia, that's a low white blood cell count. Nausea and diarrhea, we're talking about just a handful of patients, just 5 or 6%, who get significant toxicities. And 1% 1, 1 having rash, 4% having rash there, and 4% with sunicinib getting a low thyroid function test. That's an important test to ask your oncologist for, your thyroid function test, if you're actually on sutent. If we look at these figures for chemotherapy treatment, so anemia would be about 30% of patients, neutropenia about 30 to 40% of patients, nausea, diarrhea, 30% of patients. So these treatments, by and large, are much better tolerated than the treatments that we've traditionally given out to our patients. Who's the new kid on the block? Reginald Minofi. I can't say it. <laughs> but note that the reason that this probably works is it's got a wide spectrum of target inhibition. And you remember my very complicated diagram about the various targets that are there. This doesn't target one of these growth factors. It targets one KIT, PGGFR, VEGGFR, 1, 2, 3. These are the vascular ones. Ty2, RET, fibroblast growth factor, RAF, P38, MEC. And what this showed in the large phase 3 study, nearly 200 patients who had, whose disease had got worse on both imatinib and sunitinib was a significant improvement in time to progression from just one month to about five months. <laughs>
This drug is now available in the UK on a named patient basis. Um, and essentially, you have to be well enough for it, and we can apply to Bayer, who are the manufacturers of this drug, and they will give us this on a compassionate basis. Now, what will happen when it gets licensed, I think, is a rather more difficult question. Then, because it's such a rare treatment, I think we'll have to apply through the Cancer Drugs Fund for it. So that will probably happen, I would think, towards the end of this year. But this is probably the drug in the last two years that has changed again the game. So we've gone in 20, well, 20 years recognising a drug, 10 years from no treatment to three active and approved drugs in the disease. So we now get into loads of difficult names, IBS, MABS, OBS, and I'm going to give, try to give a little bit of generalised signpost rather than a whole lot of these trials. There are, these are the trials that are, that are actually happening for patients with GIST. But there are a large number of potential trials that are available. And the drugs I think to look out for uh, is this HSP90 inhibitor, which at the, name, at the moment has the sexy name of AUY922. <laughs> these other drug, drugs, Pazapanib, is a drug that's already used in kidney cancer that's not far off reporting this trial, as is the drug of crinolinib, which is quite interesting because it's got very specific targeted mutation that it's being used in. So these are the trials that are up and running for, for most patients, but clearly, I know there's people in this room with wild type gists, this drug lincitinib, which is actually being used specifically for people with adult and paediatric wild type gist. That's a study that's actively recruiting. I don't think that's recruiting in this country, to my knowledge. That's in the States, isn't it? But you can see that already we're starting to think about subgroups of patients. And I think that that's quite important. And if we think about subgroups of patients rather than individual patients, we're more likely to make progress. And these are the sorts of classes of compounds where all the interest is. And this interest is not just about GIST patients, this is about tumours in general. And many of these trials of these various drugs will not be for patients with GIST, but in the first instance there will be a phase 1 trial, just like the very first patient who had a GIST. And essentially, a phase 1 trial is a first-in-man trial. So this is a drug that looks good in the laboratory, there's a good rationale for using it, but we don't know whether it's usable, in other words, safe in man. And that's actually what a phase one trial is. It's not about does the drug work, it's about what is the right dose, is it safe? And so these are the experimental treatments that people often want, but there are a number of things to remember about it. Remember it's a safety study, so it can do harm as well as good. If you look at all phase one studies that are done throughout the world, the chance of the cancer shrinking is 4%. So in other words, most phase ones don't work. If you have a phase one drug, which actually shows some activity, you're almost certainly onto something. Because to be eligible for that trial, you have to have failed all conventional treatment. That doesn't mean that they're not important. So people who are with GIST, who are going to get exposure to many of these drugs, are going to be in phase one studies that are designed for virtually any patient with cancer, where, as I say, the real thing is about safety. So, the first group to think about are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and that's the sort of group which Glyvec belongs to. There's the horrible list. But it's good. What, for, for me, what it shows is that there's actually a lot of interest, and there are a lot of drugs coming to market. Do you know how much it costs to bring a new drug to market now? $4 That's it? So, and then people say, well, why aren't there new classes of antibiotics? Well, if you have a new drug, and uh, you may test it very extensively. It costs you 12 billion, you say, to bring it to market. And then patients start having side effects, they sue, and they don't like the drug companies making a profit. Well, we can't have it both ways, I'm afraid. Without profits, the companies aren't going to invest in R&D. And actually, we haven't had a new class of antibiotic now for 25 years. That is really serious. I think these HSP90 inhibitors, they're showing promise as well. They target a heat shock protein, which their aim is really to make sure that, it says what they do here, but they, their aim really is to make sure that our protein structure is intact. And so the idea is that if the protein structure starts to break down, in other words, the backbone that holds everything together within a tumour, the tumour will shrink. 
And so actually that's looking quite a promising strategy in a number of tumours. So we've already talked, talked about the fact that we have to get the right light switch or the right switch in the right place, and that's what these inhibitors of pathways downstream of KIT and PGGFR are about. Another horrible long list of drugs. But actually, the industry, when you think about it, and we've talked about the costs and the risk of bringing drugs to market, huge long list of drugs there. So, I deliberately haven't gone too long through those list of drugs. I think it's a bit daunting. But it's important to remember that this is actually a triumph of personalised medicine. It's actually one of the major advances in oncology. Just be a little bit careful of Daily Mail enthusiasm. If you read the Daily Mail every day, we've beaten cancer every day for the last 20 years. In general, it, uh, improvements have actually been incremental, and there's often one step back and one step forward. But clearly genuine progress since 2000. Three drugs licensed and active in a very rare disease. That's, that's pretty much unheard of. But in amongst all that great science and in all those great new drugs, don't forget the basic treatments. Our surgeons are still the people who cure the most patients. Thank you for your attention.